Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books. I did not expect this many people, so you're making me nervous now. Uh, tonight at 7 p.m., the world premiere of our little movie called They're Coming Get You Wheeling. It's a Halloween film. You can see it on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channels. And then next week, All Zombies Are Local with the poet Allison Patini Davis. You may have seen her here at the Wheeling Poetry Series. But she talked about zombies being local, and so I was intrigued and asked her to do a program about it. And that'll be our Halloween program next week on the 26th at noon. So before we start, I'll introduce our, our guest today. Guitarist Aaron Carey has been teaching and performing for over 20 years, both locally and nationally. He earned a Master of Education from Bethany College and a Bachelor of Arts in Music from West Virginia University. A Bethany College music faculty member since 2005. Carey also teaches at CA House Music and is active at a, as a solo performer and in several groups. And I should uh, thank him for bringing the sound system today because ours decided to uh, break down. And uh, so without that, we would have, we would not have a program. So thank you, Aaron. Uh, the poetry you'll be hearing today comes from Dr. Bonnie Thurston, a native of West Virginia who lives near Wheeling. She earned the BA in English, first honors from Bethany College, and the MA and PhD degrees from the University of Virginia. Bonnie has written or edited 23 theological books, contributed to reference works in New Testament, and taught at the university level for 30 years. Her poetry has been anthologized and frequently appears in periodicals. The author of six volumes of verse, Bonnie is an avid reader, gardener, and cook, enjoys classical music, and loves the West Virginia hills. Today you're going to hear about uh, Lady Liberty, uh, primarily some of the early story, the early story of her construction, but more importantly, this is not a history lesson so much as it is a tribute and an interpretation. So please enjoy.
Memory is vitally important, and when we think about the conception in the beginning, we have to remember back to the beginnings. And we have to remember that um, we, in our European ways, were um, imposed, superimposed, on the existing societies in the New World in which we and the French um, are newcomers, in fact. We have to remember, I think, that we all came from somewhere else. Um, uh, and that we displaced the folks who lived here before we did. So um, since mother, or since Lady Liberty is more than old enough to be one, and I know what the um, audience of Lunch with Books is, I decided I would begin with two poems spoken in the uh, voice of grandmothers, because grandmothers are usually the keepers of our memories. And so we remember that Lady Liberty symbolizes freedom for all of us now. And the first poem is called Grandmother Remembers Eagles, and it's in the voice of a Native American grandmother. Now I'm old and bound to Mother Earth, my face crevassed as hers. And we will soon again be one. When I am afraid, she whispers, remember, remember eagles, creation keepers. And I think of strong hooked beaks and yellow talons sunk deep in silver-bodied salmon taken from rivers to treetops to feed her young. Her flight is slow, deliberate, her wings straight out. She submits to the wind, allows it to lift her to invisible places. She carries messages and will bring me Mother Earth's great spirit summons. When the eagle comes, there is blessing. Her vision is clear. Her greatest power is seeing both sides of the mountain. And the second poem is called Grandmother Muses on Fire, and the voice is of an old Appalachian woman, and she's thinking about the stories that she has heard about the Scots-Irish who came in um, to this part of the United States, as you well remember. And there's a word you might not recognize, it's smoored. And smoring a fire is putting peats over it so that it won't go out during the night. And there's a reference to the clearances, and that was the clearances of the highlands in Scotland that led to the um, Scots-Irish immigration, and it was because the English wanted to cut down the forests, and so they had to get rid of the farmers. So there's the clearances, and that was the time when most of the Scots-Irish, um, the first wave of Scots-Irish immigration. So this is another voice of a grandmother, but this is a, an Anglo-Saxon grandmother this time. The stove gave the only light. The only sounds were the hiss of a bit of wet wood and the creak of her rocker on uneven floorboards. Never take fire for granted, she counseled. Watch out for progress. Long ago, across the ocean, when night was coming on, the women smoored the fire buried it in ashes, laid it down in peats with powerful prayers. Before morning, they lift them, the mother's breath fanning the coals to fire to the first flickering flames. Those hearth fires never died. They banked them real good. And when the children left to marry, they took the home fire with them like a living memory, the life breath of a family. Bonding fires, they're called. They say at the clearances, the clans brought their fires with them on the ships and across the Alleghenies to our green mountains. I wonder about that. But I heard tell of one bonding fire kept for 300 years, the last by an old man all alone. And then a dam burst and flooded his valley, 
and covered his hearth under 200 feet of water and smothered his fire and killed his connection to his kin. It was mighty sad, she said, staring down at her own fire and the watery conflagration of that poor old man's past. And so with Lady Liberty, we remember. When built, Liberty Enlightening the World, her original name, was the largest land structure ever manufactured by humans, featuring the largest concrete pour and the largest copper piece. The idea came from the French scholar, Edouard René de La Bollier, the father of the Statue of Liberty, who conceived the statue in 1865 to honor the centenary of American independence in 1876. La Boulier admired the American system of constitutional government, but saw slavery as the great sin it was against freedom. He, like many, wondered could this form of dem democratic government survive? According to the National Park Service, La Boulier was a prolific French abolitionist who believed that the end of slavery marked the realization of American democratic ideals embodied in the Declaration of Independence. His use of references to the French role in the American Revolution to generate support for his efforts on behalf of American slaves and freedmen are critical to understanding his conception of the Statue of Liberty. Thus, he followed the American Civil War closely, and when slavery was brought to an end, La Bollier was relieved. For him, France's grief for the people after Lincoln's assassination reignited the bonds of friendship established in the American Revolution through the, the Marquis de Lafayette. La Bollier wanted a collaborative monument that would celebrate the historic friendship between the U.S. and France. The French sculptor of liberty would be Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, the French engineer would be Alexander, <coughs> excuse me, Gustave Eiffel, famous, of course, for a certain tower in Paris. The American architect was Richard Morris Hunt, who would go on to design the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina for the Vanderbilt family, as well as our statue's massive pedestal. Thank you. 
then has to be taken care of. We build things, and then we have to preserve them. And the battle cry of freedom and the uh, music that we have just heard reminds us of the truth that freedom isn't free. The people fought the tyranny of taxation without representation, and that people fought to free cruelly enslaved human beings. The military history of the United States is an old and a venerable one. And these are three poems and three different aspects of the military heritage that is so much a part of the building and the maintaining of our nations and of the freedoms that Lady Liberty represents for us. The first is called the Over Mountain Men. And you will remember that the turning point of the Revolutionary War was in 1780 when the mountain men gathered by the Sycamore Shoals of the Watauga River, crossed the mountain, whipped the British, and then went back to the mountains. So this is a poem called The Over Mountain Men, Sycamore Shoals, 1780. They gathered from mountain valleys and farms up the hollers, homestead, in long rolling valleys, sinewy men with long rifles, untrim untrimmed beards, their raggedy families in tow. They came from log cabins with mud in the chinks and for the floor, fire places with great rough stones, men who, when they saw the smoke from somebody else's chimney, moved on. What they had didn't look like much to lose but it was theirs. And some fool English officer threatened to march in a foreign army and take back their hard-won homes. It don't do to threaten mountain people. And these had faced worse than the army of an idiot king from across the sea. Weather and beasts and sarpents and pestilence the ire of the first mountaineers from whom they took the land. What was a blustering, red-coated lord in knee breeches and silver shoe buckles? They meant to kill him, and they did. Hundreds of them gathered there where the Watauga could be forded and the shoals sang of freedom. Some of them stayed to guard the women and the young, the rest marched over the mountain to do the work of war. The women waited, the river sang, and directly the menfolk returned, gathered up their kin, and went silently home to mountain farms. And if you stand by Sycamore Shoals on the Watauga, behind the rebuilt stockade and the historical markers, where the old folks stroll with their sticks of an evening, you might see a Cherokee woman and a white woman with a little child between them. Picnickers eating food they didn't sweat for. But if you listen, you can still hear the shoals sing free and strong, free and strong. The second is um, a little bit edgier. It's a post-Afghanistan poem. Twenty years later, and half a world away, we pulled up stakes. As in all wars, some came home, some did not, and some we abandoned. Our soldiers safe, we sent technology to do our killing, and it traced, targeted, and obliterated two friendly translators and seven children. 
tragic error, opined the Pentagon pundit, but we offer compensation, $2,500. Whose hubris decides what seven children and two trusted fathers are worth? And another poem called Taps, and I'm a product of the Vietnam period, so this is the kind of thing we used to see in the country churches in southern West Virginia where I grew up. Taps. This perfect autumn day with its wood-smoked air is pure Americana, a page from Norman Rockwell. The white clabbered church with its tiny steeple and bell the basement hall tables with the meal laid out, the ladies hovering, the line of mourners wearing black, ill-fitting suits, stiff collars and ties, dark, somber patterned dresses, hands clasped or elbows linked, snake through the manicured churchyard with headstones bearing their own names, down to the neighbor dug grave, where the VFW memorial team, men older than the deceased, wait to shoot their guns, to fold and present old glory, to thank the grieving widow for her man's service to his grateful country, to play taps with the dying of this our way of life. A Boulier conceived the statue in 1865 and Bartoli began executing the design by 1870. He created a terracotta maquette now housed in the Museum of the City of New York and this bronze maquette in 1875 when construction began in earnest. With a price tag of about $250,000, about 6.5 million in current do dollars, a massive fundraising campaign to build Liberty Enlightened World was launched. To raise funds, the right arm and torch of Liberty were constructed and sent to the US to events like the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, where people could pay 50 cents to climb up into the torch the arm remained in New York for six years before being reunited with the body of the statue. The head and shoulders were also constructed and included in the Paris Exposition to raise more money. In the end, 80% of the funds came from donations of less than a dollar. To sculpt the statue's skin, Eiffel used the repose technique, molding lightweight copper uh, sheets by hammering them onto the statue's wooden framework. Eiffel designed an inner support pylon or spine that would be the forerunner to his famous tower. The support armature included over a mile of iron bars. 300 sections of copper weighing 80 tons were hammered on using more than 300,000 copper rivets. The curtain wall construction made the statue flexible enough to withstand powerful winds and extreme temperature changes. The statue was fully assembled in France between 1881 and 1884, then disassembled, packed in 214 crates, and shipped to New York, where it was uncrated. The federally owned military island of Bedloe was chosen for the reassembly and the angular Fort Wood became the pedestal's base. Hunt's pedestal required 27,000 tons of concrete and stone and stood 154 feet tall, making the entire 305 feet structure about 93 meters tall. The copper took another 30 years to oxidize to the familiar green patina 
we know today. On September 3, 1898, 12 years after the dedication, Thomas Edison's company made a film, a one-minute film of the Statue of Liberty enlightening the world. The truth is that we have to struggle to keep our ideals alive. The truth is that our military has helped us do this. The truth is that it's up to us to keep the ideals of Lady Liberty alive. And each of us has to dedicate ourselves to defending the self-evident truths that are enshrined in our visionary Bill of Rights. And obliquely, these three poems are about recovering our commitment to the common good. If I worry about anything right now, it's our sort of lack of understanding of the common good that our founders had in mind for us as a nation. So these are some poems about the commitment to the common good without which our nation cannot long endure. The first poem is called The Turning Point. I started high school the same year the two separate but equal county schools merged. We were both mostly rural and everybody got bust. But the new school got the name, the mascot, the school colors, and the song of the white school. Red and yellow, black and white, we sang in Sunday school, but this was not equal in my sight. Even before I saw those pictures in Life magazine, those angry dogs, those water hoses, those little black girls wearing the same Sunday school outfits my mother bought me. I asked questions, and suddenly I wasn't an obedient student, and a good scout, and a nice church teen, but a problem child, and a stranger to my own kindred. Uh, 
th this second poem, Kept Alive, has a superscription from the Gospel of Luke. It's what the angel Gabriel said to the Virgin Mary when he told her that God had a little plan for her. Who would argue with the angel Gabriel? But this promised kingdom is a strange, hidden realm kept alive under the noses of the egotistical mighty lusting after personal gain. Kept alive under the weight of twisted, oppressive ideas and the rumble of jackboots. Kept alive by slaves singing songs of faith and freedom. Kept alive by poor people blessing the one small loaf for their hungry neighbors. Kept alive by unbelievers longing to believe but unable to see him in faith's public face. Kept alive by the imprisoned and those dying alone and unheralded. The coming child's kingdom is kept alive by blowing on the flickering ember hidden in the heart's hubble, hubble. In the deepest darkest, in the deepest darkness, the tiniest wavering light on which so much depends. This is a kind of a COVID poem. It's called Compassion in a Cold Climate. After mild December, sudden cold scalpeled in and dropped snow, a bandage covering wounds. We are all wounded, rent asunder by our irritating opinions, by our palavering politicians interested in positions of power, but not good ordinary folk who keep the engine of state chugging relentlessly on in no discernible direction. The whine of Arctic wind, the sting of sleet on skin are bracing, enlivening, a tonic against the tempting innervation of bad news from every direction, which causes an instinctive drawing protectively within. Frigid air makes breathing ragged, the lungs ache, the eyes water, makes the body remind the heart that its hidden hurts are holy only when they knit private pain to the world's awful wounds, when they keep the flame of caring and compassion alive for all of us. On October 28, 1886, Liberty Enlightening the World was unveiled and dedicated on Bedloe Island in New York Harbor. She was hailed as the eighth wonder of the world and faded with a parade through the streets of New York and the naval procession. Amid speeches by dignitaries on a cold drizzle, President Grover Cleveland dedicated the statue. Estimates of attendance ranged from thousands up to one million. But not everyone was celebrating. New York suffragists led by Matilda Jocelyn Gage protested the dedication. Gage said, it is the sarcasm of the 19th century to represent liberty as a woman, while not one single woman throughout the length and breadth of the land is as yet in possession of political liberty. Though denied tickets because they were unaccompanied women, the suffragists chartered a boat and held up banners and gave speeches. After the event, Bartoli was said to have been satisfied with the outcome of his many years of labor. <laughs>
memory again with a picture of people looking toward a new home and we remember that we are a nation of immigrants we remember the old ways because there are roots but from there we must continue as a nation to forge new identities and new symbols along with the old they'll be our flowering we who came from many nations love and call this land home. <clears throat> the first poem is called The Gift of Distance, and the image on the screen is a wonderful one because what I was trying to do in the poem is, was to bring together the image of people traveling on a ship to this country <clears throat> and then the reforging of a new identity. It's a little bit of an odd poem. Don't worry if you don't get it. I'm not sure I got it either. <laughs> this is called The Dark Gift of Distance. We assumed that the daily crush requires we calmly carry on no matter what happens. But in turbulent times of enforced separation, solitude proper space for things we didn't grieve, sets aside distinctions and commands us attend to what you lost or refused to acknowledge. Watch your inner self as if it were the vast deep ocean that it is. Let the rising air bubbles from the long submerged wreckage of your wars lead you down to rusted, barnacled hulls where second-class decks or even steerage seem to hold light and love. You survived the sinking, but you never left the lifeboat. You hid the sorrow behind the expected brave facade, leaving some essential part of your dearest self in the darkness. Only self-inflicted deafness muffles today's siren song. Return, remember, weep if you must and can. The sea is already salty. Its storms keen with you will bring you to the harbor you are bound for long for and have been promised. So this next um, poem is about this area and I wrote it one Sunday morning driving between uh, Wheeling and Washington, Pennsylvania along 70 and it, the poem is called uh, Palm Sunday Driving Westwood which is um, stolen of course from a John Donne poem. So don't tell him, but he's been dead a long time. He probably won't sue me. Uh, it's all about thinking about the people who were here, just right here before my family got here in the 18th century. I see the greening but not leafed out world. Why the Scots-Irish settled and loved these rolling hills so like the land they left gnarled outline of trees like home's horizon. I see the flattened place where the old wagon track ran. Usually hidden by forest, it is the mystery of the road not taken or even known. Stark, tangled image of the absence of expectation 
that an alternative might exist. We settle in places and for what seems familiar. Today's procession proclaims the way does not take us where we thought to go. The road itself changes, remade in the shadow of three twisted trees. So I'm from southern West Virginia coal country where the roads aren't too good, but the people are great. And so this last, uh, this last poem is a spin-off on the, you did Doc, Rocks, Doc Watson riffs on that last, I heard Doc Watson there. Um, this is a riff on uh, the Don, John Denver uh, Country Roads Take Us Home. There's nothing much hot or hurried about our shaded lanes. Ours is not a place of superhighways, but twisted back roads, lane and a half at best. A place that teaches the necessity of yielding, the grace of giving way, in part by narrowness, in part by the obscurity of noon green darkness in forested valleys and hairpin turns that hide what comes next. We cussed the coal trucks, but now there is a sad lonesomeness in the winding emptiness, the legacy of potholes and the brokenness they left behind. Still, traveling here reveals the harsh beauty of sparsely populated places, the proud integrity of the incomers, the folks who decided to stay on, knowing that somehow origin is destination, that the road makes us what we become, and however circuitously takes us home. <coughs> According to the National Park Service, the conventional interpretation of our statue as a monument to American immigrants is a 20th century phenomenon. In its early years, and that view was only rarely and vaguely expressed. Immigrants did not actually see the statue in large numbers until after its unveiling. In the early 20th century, the statue became a popular symbol for nativists and white supremacists. Yes, unquote, in that stark contrast to our current understanding, nativists appropriated the meaning of the statue to symbolize their claims of threats to American liberty posed by foreigners whom they portrayed as anarchists, communists. Quoting NPS again, official use of the statue's image to appeal to immigrants only began in earnest with public efforts to Americanize immigrant children. In the government's advertising campaign, for World War I bombs. The French also used our statue, the one they gave us as a symbol during that war. The immigrant interpretation gained momentum in the 1930s as America prepared for war with Hitler. And by the 1950s, it had become the predominant understanding of the statue's original purpose and meaning. In the end, Liberty Enlightened the World is a massive work of public art subject to interpretation by anyone who sees it. As Yasmin Sabina Khan says in her excellent book, Enlightening the World, the Creation of the Statue of Liberty. As Bartoli composed the Liberty figure and Hunt formed a pedestal, they placed the experience of the United States in the timeless universal language. The design of the monument did not attempt to memorialize an individual or glorify a particular victory along the lines of a traditional patriotic monument. The singularly American liberty figure, devoid of nationalistic hubris, embraced all who share her aspirations. And that brings us to perhaps the best known sonnet in the world at one time. 
uh, that the new Colossus by Emma Lazarus. Emma was part of a Jewish family that had been in the U.S. since the 17th century, so she was in no way a new immigrant. A society figure and writer, she was asked to create a poem to help raise funds for liberty at an art auction. She became concerned with the plight of Jewish immigrants fleeing the pogroms in Russia. Her empathy for them inspired her sonnet for liberty. In 1903, the poem was cast onto a bronze plaque and mounted inside the pedestal's lower level. Um, and I think, and I'm asking that we all read the poem together. You have it in front of you. I'll start, you join it. Bonnie, want to come up? Sure. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs his stride from land to land. Here at our sea washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of the teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door.
Thank you all for coming on to our program. I do want to recommend this book, Enlightening the World, on which most of this was based. Uh, the library does own it. And um, happy 135th Lady Liberty. Thank you. Thank you.